Loop on the Third, the Hemingway Papers, is the second Loop on TV special broadcast in July 1990 on Nippon Television. Since Bye Bye Lady Liberty returned very solid ratings, TMS was convinced to move forward with plans for a yearly TV special, and Hemingway Papers was the first of many follow-ups. In many ways, it's a step back from the eccentricities of the previous work to tell a more grounded story centered around several familiar Loop on story elements. Quite a few of these early TV specials focus on current events or incorporate modern technology into their storylines, but Hemingway Papers feels very classic Lupin in a sense, with a more timeless storyline. Many of the same crew return from Lady Liberty for this one, including director Osamu Dezaki, writer Hiroshi Kashiwabara, and character designer slash animation director Noboru Furusei, who also worked with Lupin lifer Yuzo Aoki to design the characters. Hemingway Papers is a little more traditional than the previous TV special, with a story centered around a fabled treasure, two warring factions seeking to claim it by any means necessary, a woman caught in the middle of it all, and, of course, the Lupin gang throwing a wrench in everyone's plans. Rather than premiere on the Saturday Super Special, Hemingway Papers was moved to Nippon TV's Friday Roadshow block. Compared to the Saturday Super Special, which was a more general interest time slot, the Friday Roadshow broadcasts a lot more animation, including Studio Ghibli films, Detective Conan and Evangelion films, and films from directors like Mamoru Hosuda. It was also hosted by film critic Haruo Mizuno, who had been in the film industry for years and was clearly passionate about broadcasting high-quality movies to television audiences. Several other anime like City Hunter and Death Note would also receive TV specials for this block. And the Friday Roadshow was broadcast on Fridays at 9pm Japan Standard Time, a golden primetime slot. So it's safe to say that Lupin found a much better home, and beginning with Hemingway Papers, every subsequent TV special would premiere on the Friday Roadshow, and until 2010's The Last Job, these Lupin TV specials were an annual summer event. Hemingway Papers originally premiered on July 20th, 1990, and would later be re-aired in March of 1996. <laughs> While Lady Liberty was moderately successful in the ratings, Hemingway Papers immediately proved to be a hit, thanks primarily, I believe, to its time slot. These TV specials became a big deal in Japan, but while some have found an audience in the West, many fell by the wayside internationally. This is one such example, as while it does have home media releases outside of Japan, it, alongside many of these TV specials, isn't that well known. And in this case, I think that's a bit of a shame, as it's a pretty solid adventure. Before I explain why, let's take a look at the story. Hemingway Papers begins with Jigen and Goemon being approached by separate factions on the Mediterranean island of Kolkaka, who contract the two of them out as killers. Jigen joins the Konsano family, a private mercenary group led by the man of the same name, and Goemon joins the Kolkaka military, serving under President Carlos. For years, the two have been fighting each other over the Hemingway Papers, an unfinished novel by legendary writer Ernest Hemingway that details the location of a hidden treasure on the island. They're a big target for criminal organizations around the world, with Lupin also seeking them out, and an arms dealer named Marsis also entering the fray, with Fujiko posing as his assistant. But Jigen and Goemon aren't interested in the treasure, as they've both got their separate reasons for joining up with their respective crew. Jigen is out to assassinate an old associate named Crazy Mash, the top dog of Marsis' army who lives up to his name, and Goemon's out to find the supposed object which is Zantetsuken can't cut, as told to him by a monk who is only in this one scene in the beginning and then disappears from the movie. Anyway, the war between these two armies has torn the nation of Kolkaka apart, and one woman, a bartender named Maria, is caught in the crosshairs. She used to belong to the Scorpions, a resistance group that opposed both Consano and Carlos, who were almost all wiped out, including her brother. She harbored a deep resentment for both groups and the treasure as a result, and when Lupin enters the picture, she's obviously not too keen to get involved with the hunt. But with both armies closing in and Lupin's persistence, it's only a matter of time before the truth behind the Hemingway papers is revealed. Oh, and Zenigata is there too. Again. Compared to the wild, uneven ride that was Lady Liberty, this special is more down-to-earth and serious, with less hijinks and certainly less grandeur. 
Lupin's not stealing the Statue of Liberty this time. He's after a series of papers that detail a treasure of unknown proportions, and rather than deal with a story that impacts the entire world, this is instead a more isolated, personal adventure. It's more the tale of a country torn apart by years of bloodshed over intrinsically meaningless scraps of paper, and the fallout that results from it. And while that political struggle is a large part of this narrative, there's still plenty of elements that are familiar to any Lupin story. A treasure sought out by multiple factions, Jigen hunting an old friend who's turned rotten, Goemon training himself to become stronger, an object that the Zantetskin can't cut, all beats we've seen before. Hemingway Papers isn't the strongest at any of these points, and really, it's in tying everything it wants to do together where the movie falters. Let's start with the main treasure, for instance, which centers around a conspiracy surrounding Ernest Hemingway. The legend goes that Hemingway heard of a treasure hidden on Kolkaka and turned the quest for the treasure into a novel. Then, he's attacked and murdered by an unknown assailant and his manuscript is stolen, and those papers have been missing ever since. I couldn't find any evidence to suggest that this is a real conspiracy with corroborated or even auxiliary evidence, but it could be inspired by one of two things. The first is several unfinished manuscripts that Hemingway left behind in Cuba, one of which would be published in Japanese just a few months after the special premiered. The other is Hemingway's paranoia and fears of espionage during his lifetime, feelings that weren't unfounded as it was revealed that the FBI was monitoring him because of his relationship with Cuba. Whatever the case, it's not the last time a Lupin story would tie into Hemingway's work, although I confess that I haven't read any Hemingway myself, so I can't comment on any relation this story might or might not have to any of his work. What I can say is that for such a high-profile author, the special doesn't really focus on that legacy too much. You could replace Hemingway with any other name, real or fictional, and it would make no difference. The papers only serve as a backdrop since it's more focused on the war and the ramifications on the people of Kolkaka. It's an interesting direction, but I wish the film leaned further into this and the implications of its plot. This is a place that has suffered immensely under a brutal war, and the effect is definitely there, but when the hunt for the papers eventually takes priority by the end, it feels a little too sidetracked. Especially since the treasure is a stockpile of pure uranium, useless for making a straight profit, but invaluable to military seeking to establish dominance. So it makes sense that the villains would be so invested in it, but once the movie ends, I don't feel like it delivered the full story that it could have. But the thing is, while the pieces don't always connect everything together nicely, independently, they actually kinda work. Kolkaka is a very solid setting, purposefully desolate thanks to its situation, but also hosting a number of good set pieces. It looks exactly like a town that's been ravaged by destruction, and another example of the more homespun, less glamorous tone this movie takes. While I do like loop on stories that go down roller coaster rides unrestricted by scope, I also appreciate smaller, intimate stories like this when they're done well. And Hemingway Papers... doesn't do it well, but it does it all just fine. The strengths of this special lie more so in the cast, with both the Lupin gang and the unique characters getting some great scenes and moments. Lupin is a bit dopier here, still the same clever thief, but playing more into the role of the classic Shakespearean fool, clearly smarter than anyone else, yet never letting that intelligence slip. But to be honest, I think he's one of the weaker characters this time around because he's a little more subdued. Fujiko also falls a bit too far into her usual role for me, never really given a chance to shine, and the less I say about Zenigata's arc, the better. Seriously, he's in this movie for maybe five minutes, and every second he's on screen, he's just being kicked down further and further. It's disgraceful. Jigen and Goemon, however, definitely feel beefed up, as both of them are tied heavily to the main villains and intersect with the other stories in awesome ways. Jigen retains that cool-headed, serious nature, with less time for Lupin and the rest, and while Goemon's story arc isn't spectacular, it's great seeing how he acts when under the supervision of a bigger power. Their interactions are a definite highlight, since they're begrudgingly on opposite sides initially, and the conflict they have to manufacture is very engrossing. Something I haven't touched on that much in this retrospective is the Jigen Goemon relationship, which, in my opinion, is an underrated bit of character building. Both men trust and respect Lupin, but in most of their incarnations, I think both would be hard-pressed to say he's their friend. But while Lupin is often the glue that holds everyone together, Jigen and Goemon both have a sense of honor and dignity that cements their bond as companions. 
I could go on about the group dynamics between these characters, but for Hemingway Papers, it's a great showcase of the intense esteem they hold for each other as allies and fighters. And while they're not the best in the series, I actually really like the newcomers this time around. Maria fills the role of the Lupin girl very well, tough and take no nonsense, but not stone cold, with a good reason why she doesn't act very friendly to Lupin at first. I do wish we had more backstory surrounding her relation to the island and the villains, but that aside, she's a fun character and a good addition. I really like her design, too. I'm not sure who drew her initially, as there's multiple character artists this time, but it's an awesome look that's somehow extravagant and understated at the same time. The villains also intrigue me, thanks to their conflict really taking center stage. Carlos and Consano play the warring generals very well, though I admit I'm not that crazy about Marces, another stereotypical rich old guy who, I don't know, has some nice sunglasses, I guess? But special shoutout has to go to Crazy Mash, the psychotic villain who is a delight to watch. It's awesome to see such an insane character like this who still has a modicum of elegance and subtleness to him. But while the characters do bring a lot to the table, sometimes the aesthetics can bring it down. The animation in particular is a mixed bag, not terrible overall, but not quite as impressive as Lady Liberty. On a shot-by-shot -shot basis, it can either look really good or really bad, especially with the character faces and reusing animation. I'm not going to pick apart specific scenes or animators, as I doubt it's as simple as the person in charge of which part of the movie, but it does indicate fewer resources to spare here on the production side. It could be that since Lady Liberty didn't pull in incredible ratings, and perhaps because of the financial sting of Fuma Conspiracy and TMS's financial struggles during the 80s, the studio wasn't willing to pull out all the stops this time. If nothing else, it shows how much Dizaki and his team were able to do, even with limited funds. His style is once again on full display, and overall used to better effect, with lots of great lighting and shadow contrasts and blurred motion. There's a ton of great split-screen shots this time, really pushing a manga-esque look with the characters talking to one another. So stylistically, the movie is on point, but the quality of the animation does sometimes suffer heavily and makes the movie feel a little... cheap. Obviously, this is a TV special, so I can't judge it too harshly, but still, if you're the type who values fluid animation, then this special is certainly not for you. At least the soundtrack is pretty decent this time, with a couple of really great stings and short pieces, plus a pretty great use of Yuji Ono's soundtrack. I still love that opening theme, of course, but damn if I don't find the ending theme annoying, if only because they play the intro of it so many times throughout the movie. The song is He's Gone, composed by Ono and performed by Michiko Kihara, and lyrics once again written by Yoshiko Miura. On its own, not a bad song, but hearing those first few bars so many times throughout the special does kinda irritate me. On the whole, Hemingway Papers is a bit of an odd case as a loop on TV special that is not uh, special in any real way, but one that I still kinda like. The story elements don't work quite that well together, but individually they work well enough, and while I realize that that might turn some people away, the strong parts here are very strong. Nothing in Hemingway Papers is mind-blowing, and if you're a casual Lupin fan, you'll probably be fine just skipping this one, or at least putting it on the back burner. But I was still fairly satisfied revisiting this one, and at the very least, it's much more cohesive as a narrative than Lady Liberty. Now that Lupin has landed himself in the 90s, we're in an era of Lupin that I'm not super familiar with, as these early TV specials do tend to gel together in my memory. We'll be looking at the 1991 special Steal Napoleon's Dictionary, which I'll admit that I remember absolutely nothing about next time. But for now, if you enjoyed this video, then give it a like, leave a comment, and be sure to subscribe and click that bell to be notified when new videos go live. Which of the Loop on the Third TV specials is your favorite? Let me know, I'd love to know which one you guys are looking forward to revisiting with me. Until next time, this is Cloud Connection, signing off.